Morning. We all want those that we love to be around longer, right? So maybe you've tried to convince someone that you care about to eat a healthier diet, quit smoking. And on a broad scale, public health officials try to do this as well. They do this with health campaigns because there are a lot of data showing that behaviors that we can change, like smoking, sitting around too much, or for teens, car crashes, are the leading causes of death. So if we could change these behaviors, if we could motivate people to want to change them, it could have a really big impact. If we have an effective campaign, it could save many, many lives. Whereas if we have an ineffective campaign, it could waste millions of dollars or even make things worse. But figuring out what's going to be an effective campaign is actually a really challenging task. For example, if you think back on the various anti-smoking messages you've seen in your lifetime, now consider the following ad. I quit. Uh-uh, man. Yesterday. Girl. But I can always quit again tomorrow. Quitting is hard, but dialing 1-800-QUIT-NOW is easy. Okay, so if you were a public health official, considering whether to spend your budget on a series of ads, a campaign made up of fingers that look like people encouraging people to call a tobacco quit line, you might first start with your own intuition, right? What do you like? What don't you like? Do you think this will be an effective ad? And in a study that my colleagues and I ran, we started out with some similar information. We went and talked to a number of different professionals about what kinds of televised anti-smoking campaigns they thought would work and not work. And their intuition suggested that this group of ads, these finger ads in a campaign, probably wouldn't be that effective. But next, you might go and talk to your target audience. We did this as well. We recruited a number of smokers, and we surveyed them. We said, which campaigns, which ads do you think are the best, and which do you think are the worst? And their intuitions also suggested that these finger ads were a little bit annoying. They might not work that well. But the problem with both of these methods, expert and lay intuition alike, is that people are actually notoriously bad at guessing what's going to be effective for themselves. So for smokers, what's going to motivate them to change their behavior? And for other people, what's an effective campaign on the whole? So to get around this issue, my team asked a question that hadn't really been asked before. Namely, is there hidden information in the brain that can help us figure out things that are hard to figure out otherwise? Maybe our brains are smarter than our intuitions. And what we found in my lab, I direct a lab at Penn where we spend a lot of our time trying to go behind the scenes in the brain and figure out how it makes decisions. And we've discovered that by knowing what's happening in people's brains, we can actually predict the effectiveness of campaigns, different kinds of persuasive messaging, better than just by knowing what people think is going to work. So to give you a little bit of an example of this, I told you we asked a number of different people for their opinions about those smoking ads. And actually, the finger puppet ad that I showed you was one of several in a campaign that I'm going to refer to as Campaign C. So I'm going to refer to campaign A, campaign B, and campaign C. There are three campaigns that we are comparing. And as I said, first we asked what people thought would be effective and ineffective. And the height of the bars here represents how much they liked the campaigns. So they thought campaign C would be the worst and campaign B would be the best. Next, we looked at what happened in their brains when they were watching the three different campaigns. And there we saw a slightly different pattern. We saw the greatest amount of activity in response to campaign C, then B, then A, in a part of the brain that sits right here behind your forehead and tracks how relevant and valuable people find information, how much it really resonates with them. Finally, we went on to say, how much do these campaigns actually affect something that we care about in the real world? So we looked at how much they changed calls to a tobacco quit line. What was the population level effectiveness? And there, what we found was that although all three campaigns increased calls to the quit line, they did so at different rates. So campaign C increased the calls the most, then B, and then A. So one thing you might notice is that the pattern that we saw in the brain was similar to what happened when we looked at what actually worked in the real world. And that was different than what people told us they thought would happen. So this highlights one of the limitations of just asking people what their intuitions are, 
as well as one of the potential promises of understanding how the brain works and using that to try to make better campaigns. We then went on to run another campaign to see if we could get this to happen again. And so we looked at images this time, images that highlight the dangers of smoking. And we partnered with the Michigan Center for Health Communications Research in the state of New York. And we took dozens of different images. Here I'm just showing you two. And you can see that on the surface, these two images look pretty similar. But in order to figure out which were the good images and which were the bad images, we formatted each of those images into an email. And at the top of the email, there was the tagline, stop smoking, start living. And at the bottom, there was a link where smokers that we emailed could click to get help quitting. So our real world measure of effectiveness here is going to be how many smokers, once they see one of these images, click to get help quitting. But first, what we did was we collected brain data on a really small group of smokers in Michigan. We showed them all the different images, the dozens of images that we were comparing, and we looked at what happened in this brain region that tracks self-relevance and value. Then next, in collaboration with New York, we sent an email with one image per smoker to hundreds of thousands of people. And we looked at how much they were willing to click and think about getting help. So first, what we found was that there were some clear winners and losers here. And what I'm going to show you on this slide is images that did really well, that were the winners, that generated a lot of clicks in the email campaign. I'm going to show those higher up on the slide. And then I'm going to show you the brain activity in terms of how far to the right it is. And what we discovered was that there was a clear relationship between the brain activity and the email clicks. So the images that generated the most brain activity in our small group of smokers in Michigan then went on to get the most clicks in the real world campaign in New York. For example, if we go back to those two images that we were comparing, although they look pretty similar on the surface, you can see that the one in the upper right generated both a lot of brain activity in our small group of smokers, as well as many more clicks in the email campaign. So, so far, what I've shown you is that data, that data from this part of the brain, information from this part of the brain that tracks the self-relevance and value, can predict behavioral outcomes that we care about. It can predict what people are going to do. But how do we use this in practice, right? Assuming we're not going to run every single campaign, every single idea that we want to air going forward through a brain scanner, we have to understand what the brain is telling us about why some messages are effective and why some messages are less effective. So what's the brain telling us? Well, first, I've mentioned a few times now that this part of the brain that we've been focusing on tracks self-relevance and value. So how do we make campaigns resonate? How do we make campaigns feel self-relevant to our target audience? You may have given advice to someone you care about, right? And you know that it's easy to give advice, but it's hard to give that kind of advice that resonates. So let's think about one reason that messages fail. Well, one reason that messages fail, even though we could all exercise more, eat healthier diets, right? Maybe you've tried to convince your kids to study harder, right? We could all do these things. But when we ask people to do them, you might have found that people don't like having this kind of information pointed out about themselves. We get defensive. We come up with reasons why the information doesn't apply to us. Why do we do this? Well, one of the reasons that we do it is because we all want to feel good about ourselves, right? We want to feel like we're behaving in reasonable ways. We're reasonable people, right? So when we have it pointed out that the way we're behaving isn't optimal, this can threaten that sort of self-image. Psychologists have been studying this phenomenon for a long time. And what we now know from a few decades of research is that actually, if you give people a chance to first think about sources of broader meaning and purpose in their lives, things like their friends or family, other core values that they care about, before you deliver this potentially threatening information, like a health message, what this can do is highlight that our sources of self-worth aren't tied up with any particular behavior, whether we're a smoker, whether we exercise enough. And so then that can make the specific message less threatening and can open us up to behavior change. The kinds of values that work the best are things that really give us that wider scope. So for a lot of people, this is their friends and family, maybe their religion. For me, if I were going to engage in this kind of values affirmation, or what psychologists call self-affirmation, I might think about my husband and our now four-week-old twins, 
and all of the meaningful things that I'm hoping that we get to do together going forward. And what our lab has found is that if you first give people a chance to do this kind of self-affirmation, it fundamentally changes the way the brain responds to the information that comes next. For example, we studied this in the context of people sitting around too much. And we found that self-affirmation can change that. Sitting around too much has a number of negative health consequences, from feeling worse on a day-to-day -day basis to increasing your risk for heart disease and cancer. But if you get a chance to self-affirm first, that can change the way you process information about the benefits of getting more active. And the way we've studied this is by bringing people in whose level of couch potato dumb, or for many of us, desk potato dumb, puts us at increased levels of risk. And some of the people we've given a chance to first self-affirm, to think about these sources of broader meaning and purpose in their lives. Whereas the other people don't. We have them just think about something that's less important to them first. Then, while we look at what's happening in their brains, everybody's exposed to messages like, the more you sit, the more damage it does to your body. Or, according to the American Heart Association, people at your level of physical inactivity are at increased risk for heart disease. And we've discovered that the people who get to self-affirm first, the people who think about these sources of meaning and purpose, before we show them the health messages, show much more activity in these self-relevance and value regions in the brain than people who aren't affirmed. And then, the people who are affirmed go on to change their behavior more in the month following. So something as simple as reflecting on core values that we all have, there are things that are important to all of you, Reflecting on those kinds of things can fundamentally change the way our brain responds to the information that comes next. And as we think about how to change ourselves, our loved ones, and our communities for the better, the brain is helping us understand how this kind of focus on meaning and values has benefits not only in itself, but also in opening the brain to positive change. And even though Health and happiness are areas where we feel like we know ourselves really well. We feel like we know what's going to help us take the next step and do better. Our intuitions about these things often turn out to be wrong. But data, including secrets that are hidden in the brain, can help us figure out what works and what doesn't work. It can also help us figure out how to create the conditions that make people more in open, make people more open to information that can help them lead healthier and happier lives. Thank you.